everyone, it is Mr. Hallam, and uh, I just want to say I hope everything went well with the AP test. I haven't gotten too much feedback from you guys, so if anyone wants to shoot me an email or shoot me a message, let me know how it went. Um, I'll be seeing your AP test in a couple weeks when I get them. Um, but let me know, let me know how you think it went. Uh, what what you know within your your means. So. Um, but we're going to finish the course here over the course of the next three weeks. Now, a lot of it uh, is not going to be a ton of work on you. What, I, what I'm going to do is for each week, I'm going to ask you um, just kind of to respond to a piece of this, um, of, of this lecture, you know, of kind of your thoughts or evaluating uh, the effectiveness of some things. An AP level question, but I do want to get some of your opinions on it. Um, it, it could be a paragraph. It doesn't have to be super long. We'll do that this week. We'll do that next week. Oh, last week of school, uh, well, I'm not sure. We'll see how it goes. The seniors have like two days. So um, we'll go from there. But I'm going to cover from 1945 through uh, the 1960s, some pieces of that, some pieces I'll save for next week. Uh, so it's kind of a lot of content. Uh, you know, I don't know how long this is going to go, um, but uh, hopefully you find it enjoyable if you decide to watch it. So um, let's pick up kind of the end of World War II. I talked about uh, Harry Truman, right? Franklin Roosevelt dies in office after he wins his fourth term. And his vice president, Harry Truman, um, a senator from Missouri, so kind of a Southern Democrat um, who was pro-civil rights. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, he's going to make the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan, a decision he talked about wrestling with. Do you invade? Do you lose 500,000 troops? Um, or do you drop two atomic bombs, which is what we did? So um, that's going to kind of end the, the Japanese um, piece and also pits the world into this post-World War II kind of haze um, where, uh, which is something we'll get into, England has to rebuild, France has to rebuild, Germany has to rebuild, we're going to help um, Japan rebuild, um, and it really leaves two countries at the core of the world. It's the United States, the capitalist democracy, and the Soviet Union, the com you know communist um, country. So we'll get into that. Let's talk a little bit about the politics within America. Uh, first, before we get into the international stuff, which I, which I think is most interesting, but um, you know Harry Truman was was pro labor. He's going to be you know, uh, and I think it's something that FDR was as well. But um, Harry Truman was almost more pro labor with a big stick to business. Um, if you remember during World War II, he kind of suspended striking. Right, FDR say hey, don't go on strike. Businesses keep paying your workers, you know, during the Depression, then during World War II, that kind of continued. We have to fight through this war effort. Let's save it for afterwards. Well, the war's over. So now it's time for unions that are not getting what they feel they should in terms of working conditions, in terms of um, wages, to strike back. And Truman's going to support those unions more than the businesses. He will even threaten to seize businesses and negotiate on their behalf give unions a good deal then give the business back something that you know if a president um said if, if president obama or president trump threatened that today man it would be uh heads would explode at the power you know the executive would be wielding there but it worked in a lot of cases businesses uh, did not do that um would would actually give some favorable deals it helped for more pro-union stuff the other thing he was he was pro-civil rights so um he's going to sign an executive order integrating the armed forces so the army the navy um the the, the marines um the air force all of these are going to have to integrate so segregation gone um that is not going to make a big part of the democratic party happy um and you know the southern democrats who have been democrats you know pre-civil war uh, fought for slavery, you know, fighting for segregation. Um, this is a group that, that supported FDR despite some leanings of him being more pro-civil rights, but he wasn't too explicit with it. Harry Truman is. And usually in the military, um, it sometimes it's kind of the first step in uh, social change because it's really easy for the president to sign a piece of paper and implement it. You don't think the military has progressive but it kind of can be and so um when harry truman is up to run um himself um you know he took over for fdr served almost that full term and he's going to run again for president 
um, part of the Democratic wing is not going to support him. The Southern Democrats are not going to support him. And they're going to call themselves the Dixiecrats, right? They're deep in Dixie. And they're going to walk out of the Democratic convention and they are going to bring in kind of their own candidate um, in, in Strom Thurmond. And, um, you know, try to derail uh, Harry Truman's presidency. It gets to the point where no one thinks Harry Truman's going to win. Um, the pre- you know, he's not going to win. Um, that it's going to be the Republican um, uh, Dewey, the governor of New York. Um, it, the newspapers even print that Dewey defeats Truman. And um, Truman ends up squeaking out of victory. So there's a very famous picture of Harry Truman holding up a newspaper that says that he lost with a giant grin on his face because he won. Um, and, and that happens. But kind of the South and starts starting to get kind of sick of the Democrats. Um, and this is something that will play out uh, in a little while next, next week to get to kind of where modern political parties are. Um, Harry Truman, what he ran on was the fair deal. He wanted to continue the New Deal past World War II and kind of expand on pieces of that. Um, So that was kind of his platform. Now, let's get into the international affairs, because I think that's kind of the the, the key part to take uh, moving forward uh, after high school, you know, from this. And um, let's kind of rewind back to uh, World War I, right? Russia has a revolution. Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks lead that revolution and um, turn to communism. And uh, we're scared of that. We have the Red Scare uh, after that, fearing that communism could come to the United States or a lot of immigrant anarchists. It was a big problem. Fast forward to World War II, and there's fighting on both fronts, right? The Eastern and the Western Front. Um, Russia is fighting Germany in Russia, and, and the Soviet Union's getting beat. They're getting beaten. And Stalin asks for help from the United States after we're in the war, from France, from England. Hey, could we get some help? Uh, on the Eastern Front, you know, the, the Germans are launching this big attack to try to take the Soviet Union. And we say, nope, sorry, we're fighting on the Western Front, we're fighting the Pacific, can't help you, you're on your own. And the um, Soviet Union, they end up losing over a million people in World War II, um, the, the most casualties of any country. Uh, but they, they are victorious. They're the first to push Germany back. They're the first army in Germany. Um, and they are... They're the ones that are going to take Hitler's body. They're the ones going to find him committed suicide. They're going to find the first concentration camps. Um, So, you know, this is all kind of included in that. And uh, part of what happens with that is that as the Soviet Union advances, pushes Germany back, they're actually going to start taking land, the land that Germany had taken, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, um, all the way through the uh, the eastern side of Germany. They're going to take it as part of the Soviet Union. This is going to be their land now because they, they, they want it. Um, and that's that's going to cause some problems because that's uh, communism, right? And so communism just now has just expanded to all that territory that Germany had. Um, Stalin's not going to like us very much. We didn't help him out. Uh, we have been very anti-communist, not spoke highly of him. Um, and at the same time, we're super suspicious of communism. We're scared it's going to bring down democracy if it spreads further throughout the world. So Harry Truman kind of has to take on the forefront of this. Um, you know, he he has to decide, how, what are we going to do to deal with this? And this is the Cold War. This is going to last through the 1990s. So we're talking 50 years we're going to be fighting with the Soviet Union, not with weapons, not with guns. We're not going to go to war and start dropping bombs on them, but we're going to fight in a lot of different ways. It's democracy against communism it's capitalism against communism who can get the most countries under their their wing who can get the 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 most land uh, who can win and harry truman his policy is called containment uh we call it the truman doctrine right kind of like the monroe doctrine right the truman doctrine and it's containment and the idea is is pretty simple it's okay after world war ii we know where communism is now Soviet Union took all these these countries. Um, they have influence in places like China and uh, Cuba. And um, those countries can be communist. But if communism spreads any further, then we have to stop it. Okay? So think of it like a, a Ziploc container, right? You know, you, you, you put your leftovers in there and you pop on that lid. And it's fine. But if we start, stu- if we start stuffing, if anything flows over a little bit... We gotta we gotta clean it up. We gotta stop it, and that's that's gonna be containment. So things are good where they are. We don't want to push it 
any further. We don't, we're not trying to get rid of communism. That's not the goal. But if it spreads further, that's scary, right? You know, if, if communism spreads to Japan, then it could spread over to America. And then we're really screwed. So keep it where it is. Um, and the pro- kind of the problem with this was there's a lot of countries after World War II in South America, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, uh, all over the place, and in, in, East, in Asia, East Asia. Um, a lot of countries that, you know, their governments kind of toppled over. Uh, maybe they were fascist as well. Um, so they are kind of leaning one way or the other. Should they be communist? Should they be capitalist? Should they be have a democracy? I don't know. So we want to influence them. Our goal is, is to, to make them be a capitalist democracy. And that plan is going to be called the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan is very simple. Uh, if you are, um, you know, Argentina um, or, or Chile and you are deciding on a, um, on a new government, right, we'll give you money. We'll give you money to uh, move and be a capitalist democracy. Obviously, Soviet Union is going to do the same thing. They're going to be offering up money straight for you to be communist. So what do you do if you're a country like this? You know, if you're Bolivia and you're deciding which, um, which you want to be, right? A smart thing to do would be to go to the United States and be like, hey, how much are you going to pay us to be a capitalist democracy? We'll, we'll give you $10 million. You go over to the Soviet Union. Well, that'll give me $10 million, right? Soviet Union. How, how much are you going to give me? Oh, we'll give you 20 Go back to the United States. Well, they're going to give you 20 So these countries are going to make a ton of money uh, from us or Soviet Union to convert to that way. And, and, and we're going to kind of win out in the Marshall Plan sense. Um, the other thing we do is, is create kind of an alliance to defend uh, NATO, uh, which still exists today, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, not North America. So we have a lot of those European countries, Canada, uh, et cetera, involved. Um, that's going to be our, our, our alliance. Go back to World War One, right? Alliances. Uh, kind of kind of risky, but the idea was if a communist country attacks one of these capitalist democracies, we all are going to declare war. On the other side, Soviet Union starts the Warsaw Pact. Same thing. All these Soviet countries, all those countries that they had kind of uh, gotten and, and, and um, acquired and became communist, we're going to make a pact. Capitalist democracy attacks one of us, we declare war. Everyone declares war on them. And so this creates kind of the Iron Curtain for... Um, Soviet Union. So they got all this land uh, on the western side of the Soviet Union through Germany, and it kind of puts up this, this iron curtain that you can't really pass. You can't really get to the Soviet Union. You, you want World War III? Uh, you know, there's a lot of air land you're going to have to get through before that happens. So, uh, you know, the, the Steelers in the 70s had the steel curtain defense. You've heard that. This is actually what it comes from. It comes from the iron curtain um, with that. Let's talk about Germany very quickly, because Germany is going to be an interesting situation. Um, uh, Hitler's gone. Nazis are gone. They don't really have a government anymore. And if you remember the Soviet Union, they took uh, Eastern Germany for themselves, including the capital Berlin. It's a problem. Um, and on the other side, us, Britain and France, we swept in from the West, Western Front. We got that half. And that's literally what we're going to do. We're going to come to an agreement with the Soviet Union. We're going to split Germany into four uh, areas. The Eastern will be Soviet Union. The Western will be U.S., England, and France. We basically combine and operate with each other. I don't think it's that exact order, but you get know what I'm saying. Um, and then the capital, Berlin, will, which is in the Soviet side, will also be split in half. Um, and this creates a lot of problems, you know, because we have different goals. Uh, England, France, especially the U.S., our goal is going to be to rebuild Germany, get an ally, uh, try to rebuild them. For the Soviet Union, you know, they view Germany as, here's the country that killed a million of our people. Uh, they're not too fond of the German people. So their goal is just to extract resources, not care much about the people, and kind of keep that as a power grab. A problem with that is that uh, eventually, if you're not helping the people, uh, they don't want to be there anymore. You know, um, So people start leaving. And Stalin realizes people leave the Soviet side for the Western side. Doesn't look very good. That's, that's not a lot of power. So um, in Berlin, and there's a plan to, to kind of embrace this throughout Germany, uh, they built the Berlin Wall. They literally built a wall down the middle of the city so that you're stuck. If you're on the Soviet side, you can't get across. It's illegal. You can't leave. Um, hey, your, your uncle's on the other side? Too bad. Never see him again. Uh, it's a problem. And so, you know, imagine in Pittsburgh if just, just right, you know, right in the North Shore, they just built a wall. 
You know, if your family lives, uh, have family on the north side, can't can't go there anymore. You know, can't ever see them again. So I'm not going to get too f- deep into Germany. There's a lot I could talk about with that. Um, it'd take me another hour. Um, but, you know, it's a question if you want more. I'm happy to talk about it this week. Um, within our country, there's a big fear of communism. Um, and if you even sympathize with the communists, even if you even said, eh, maybe communism, maybe it's wouldn't be so bad, but we could adopt a little bit of it here, boom, you're, you're crushed. Um, Hollywood was a big place. You know, if an actor, an actress, or a crew member even mentioned kind of liking the Soviets, um, they were put on a blacklist. They were not allowed to operate. They were not allowed, they would not get hired by a producer ever again. You're blacklisted from Hollywood. You lose your career. Um, It happened to to many uh, famous actors and actresses and uh, performers and crew members. And um, was, it was a big black eye on on Hollywood. Um, and one of the guys that's going to be this really going to spurn this movement uh, and totality in the country, this fear, this red scare number two, is Joseph McCarthy. McCarthy was a senator um, who was probably going to lose uh, re-election. And so he, he kind of comes out and says, look, uh, na- you know, nationally, he says, look, I know that there are communists in the U.S. government, in, and, and, and they are spies for the Soviet Union. Um, and... I have a list. I have, I have a, a list of these people, and we're, we're going we're gonna to rat out everyone on this list. We're going to dig in and make sure it's right, and then we're going to punish them. We're going to get these communists out. People were freaked out. They're communists in our government. What the hell, man? So, um, and, and, and this kind of got proven. Um, Al- Alger Hiss uh, was, was a guy that worked in the State Department that was found to be a spy. Uh, he there wasn't enough evidence to persecute him, but he got persecuted of perjury. But this blew people up. Um, you know, there was the the, the Rosenbergs uh, was a couple um, who uh, the 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 man um, Julius Rosenberg sold, you know, allegedly sold um, the um, plans of the atomic bomb to the Russians, and they were him and his wife his wife for for knowing it were executed. Um, so you know, and 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 that's. You know, that, that's scary stuff. And so McCarthy was kind of making this up. He became, he was on the cover of Time Magazine. He was huge. Um, and you know, he was, he was a, a Republican. He was, uh, uh, you know, if, if, if any of the Democrats kind of went after him and said, oh, you're making this up, he'd say, well, you're on the list. Of course you'd say I'm making it up, right? And um, he eventually he actually accused the army of being communist. And people are like, mm, that doesn't make much sense. And uh, he didn't get reelected. He ended up dying. Of alcoholism, but you know that, there's a big fear there. Um, China is going to, to become communist. They're going to have a communist revolution. Chairman Mao Zedong uh, will lead this communist revolution. So now you have another huge country uh, in Asia that becomes communist, and we're going to see the first conflict of the Cold War happen uh, very soon after with Harry Truman as president. The Korean War will occur, and what happens in Korea is going to be kind of a common occurrence where uh, North. You know, North Korea is uh, attached to China, and so they're going to kind of get this communist influence, and they're going to move to communism. And their goal is going to be to unite the entire country under communism, um, where South Korea wants this capitalist democracy. So you have a civil war breakout. And if you remember, Harry Truman's Truman Doctrine, his theory of um, his, his policy of containment was, okay, um, Korea's split. At the 38th parallel, North Korea is communist, South Korea is a capitalist democracy. Um, that's where it's, it's contained, right? Then, North Korea is going to invade South Korea. Not contained anymore. Uh, now, containment comes into play. You have to fight. That is our policy. We have to contain it. we got to fight. And... Um, so, so we're going we're gonna to send troops. NATO is, is going to get involved here. And uh, we are going to be the leaders of NATO, as, as we will be for the next you know, 30, 40 years at the very least. Um, and so the, the general that's going to be in charge is a guy we know from World War II, Douglas MacArthur, who was the, um, the, the main general in the Pacific. He was the Allied commander of the Pacific in World War II. So we're right back in the Pacific He's a guy that, that's well-respected. He knows what he's doing. We're going to put him in. So um, it, th- this war kind of goes back and forth very quickly. The North Koreans invaded. They're doing really well. MacArthur comes in. We bring in the heavy artillery. We bring in the tanks. We bring in the rocket launchers. 
push them back. China says, no, 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 not quite yet. We're going to come in. You know, they send 75,000 troops. Now uh, China's in, in the game and we're fighting and pushing back. And, you know, MacArthur's getting a little bit frustrated here. He really wants to win this thing. And there's one thing we have that China doesn't have, that North Korea doesn't have, and that's the atomic bomb. So uh, Douglas MacArthur comes up with a plan. What if we drop a nuke? Come on, you, you hear this sometimes, right? When we have problems in another country, why don't we just nuke them? And Douglas MacArthur, he's bringing it out. Let's just nuke them. And that's just one. Let's use 50. 50 nukes. We nuke North Korea. We nuke China. Uh, communism, gone. We win. It seems easy, right? So he goes to Harry Truman, and he brings this up. And, and, and Harry Truman basically laughs him out of the room. Harry Truman, the guy that had to make the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan, that gives him nightmares, but we're not dropping a bomb. You are going to push them back to the 30th parallel, and you are going to stay there. Containment. Keep them contained. Douglas MacArthur kind of gives him the middle finger. and says, I'm going to do what I want. And so uh, MacArthur actually was more popular than Harry Truman. Uh, MacArthur started doing TV interviews and reporter interviews, talking about Harry Truman. He's never served a day in his life. He doesn't know what he's doing. I, you know, all, all respect, but uh, I could win this thing, and he doesn't seem to want to. Starts bashing him in the media. Truman's getting angry. And then Harry Tr Douglas MacArthur does the one thing Truman is not going to accept. He uh, actually attacks North Korea in North Korea near their uh, capital of uh, Pyongyang, and um, past the 38th parallel. That's not containment. You can't attack them there. Harry Truman calls them in. You disobeyed my order. Um, basically, you have a choice. You can retire or you can be court-martialed for disobeying the order of a superior officer, the commander-in-chief of the United States. MacArthur retires. He has a, a nice big parade, and he fades into the, the light. Uh, Truman brings in the people he wants. He stopped at the 38th parallel for about a year. We're kind of going back and forth. Not much is happening. So China, Soviet Union, United States, North Korea, South Korea, we all go to the table and say, let's let's uh, agree to a ceasefire and stop, um, you know, and stop this. And we do. Um, so uh, technically, that uh, the Korean War is still happening today, right? We still have North Korea. They're not communist anymore. Uh, they are. They've created their own form of government called Juchi, which uh, just, I don't know, just means that the Kim family's in charge. You know, the Soviet Union had uh, picked the Kim, the Kim family out to run that country. They're, they're down third, three generations now. Uh, Kim Jong-un is the leader of North Korea. They're uh, dictatorship through and through. South Korea, one of our closest allies, uh, democracy. So something I would have gone more into had we had traditional schooling. We could talk more about Korea if you want to um, at some point. Um, so after Harry Truman, um, both parties are going to recruit the same man to run for president. And that's Dwight Eisenhower, the Allied commander in Europe during World War II. Doesn't have a political background. I don't know if he's a Democrat. I don't know if he's a Republican. Let's both try to get him. Uh, he ends up choosing the Republicans, and he ends up winning. Uh, he's He is the, the squeaky clean candidate, you know, war general, older guy, uh, knows what he's doing, um, you know, good-looking, rugged, uh, high character, everything you want. So to kind of guarantee the victory... Um, the vice presidential candidate they pick is Richard Milhouse Nixon, the governor of California. Richard Nixon, not such a squeaky clean fellow. During the campaign, we found out that he took money and bribes and gifts from supporters when he ran for governor. Maybe when he was running for vice president, too. Um, at that time, it was not illegal. It now is. That would be bribery um, to kind of personally, you can give money to the campaign, but you can't give it to the, person, to the candidate uh, individually. And um, so, you know, it's kind of foreshadowing next week. Um, we'll get into Richard Nixon will eventually become president and have one of the biggest falls in U.S. history. Um, and uh, this is kind of a, a, a foreshadowing of that. You know, Nixon will come out on TV and he'll basically say, I guess it wasn't TV yet, uh, but he basically comes out nationally and gives the checker speech. Um, and why it's called the checker speech, because one of those gifts was his family dog, Checkers, uh, and is a cute dog. So he comes out and says, I'll give back the money. I'll give back the gifts. My kids love this dog. I'm not giving back this dog. And everyone in America said, oh, that's a cute dog. We'll let him go. And probably wasn't a good call. Uh, but Dwight Eisenhower becomes president. He's going to serve two terms. Um, his, you know, his kind of peace 
to the Cold War is going to be a really interesting uh, philosophy. It's called Brinkmanship, and it sounds insane, because uh, it kind of is, but it, it worked really well. Uh, so Brinkmanship is, we're going to come out publicly, Dwight Eisenhower says, if the Soviets drop a bomb on us, they drop one bomb, a nuke, anything, we are going to send every bomb we have, including every nuclear weapon we have, we're going we're gonna to wipe them off the face of the earth. And obviously, the Soviet Union is going to respond like, well, if you bomb us, we're throwing all our nukes at you. So, um, that that's a problem. you know. So, But, you know, the, the, the nice thing is, everyone, both sides are now are scared, because if you drop a bomb, you're dead. So, then no one will drop a bomb. That's brinkmanship. That's the thinking. Like, eh, that's bad. But, it worked. It worked for the eight years that he was president. No, neither side dropped a bomb. Neither side will drop a bomb on each other, um, ever. Uh, and... That'll be that. So, there's Dwight Eisenhower, Brinkmanship. Um, let's talk about within the country a couple things. Um, so, Brown v. Board of Education's passed, and I'm, I'm going to come towards the end of, of today, talk about the civil rights movement with you um, a little bit. I might go into a, a little bit next week. Um, but Brown v. Board of Education, really important Supreme Court case, desegregated public schools. This was the first court case, and it was unanimous, that, this, that said that um, schools... Uh, could not be segregated. That was not separate but equal. Um, I think we may have talked about it. Plessy v. Ferguson ruled that a hey, separate but equal is fine. We talked about that. Um, this is going to overturn that. So that's that's a first step. Now everything can be desegregated with additional cases. Um, so that's big. We're in the 1950s here. Um, the baby boom happens after World War II. All the soldiers come home. Everyone has babies. You hear them, the baby boomers or the boomers right now, the older generation right now. They were born then. Um, that's where that comes from. Rock and roll was really big. Uh, Elvis Presley, um, uh, Chuck Berry, uh, Little Richard just passed away. He was a big uh, founder of rock and roll. Uh, this was considered the devil's music by adults at the time. And just like most music the kids like, uh, it's objectionable. It was sexual. Elvis thrust his hips a little bit so look up some Elvis videos and uh, you can watch him thrusting around there uh, the Vietnam War starts we'll talk about it next week uh, but that's going to get started we're not going to be in combat yet um, but John F. Kennedy is going to become president at the end of uh, Eisenhower's eight years John F. Kennedy's going to run against Vice President Richard Nixon and uh, ends up winning um, for a couple different reasons he was young uh, he's actually going to be the youngest elected president Teddy Roosevelt the youngest president but JFK, the youngest elected, is going to be the first ever Catholic and the only president we've had that has not been Protestant, um, John F. Kennedy. You know, his wife was young. They had young kids. Uh, he was attractive. She was attractive. Uh, great. And where he really gets the bump to the victory was the first ever televised debate happens. Richard Nixon had the flu. Didn't look so good. His campaign put some makeup on him. He looked like he was dead on stage. Uh, and John F. Kennedy looked great. So JFK wins. And um, he's going to face, you know, he's going to step in and almost immediately face some big, big events. Uh, when he takes office, the CIA, uh, who he's going to have a complicated relationship with, is going to come to him and say, hey, we had, uh, under President Eisenhower, we had started training some Cubans to overthrow Cuba. Because let me tell you what was happening in Cuba. You know, Cuba went through a Cuban revolution. Now, we talked about uh, the Spanish-American War, right? We freed Cuba, gave them their independence, but we kept our paws on Cuba. You know, we had, they had a government, they had a dictator, essentially, who was very friendly with the United States. And people were getting very angry at that in Cuba. Cubans were getting angry, and they did not want uh, to be ruled by a centralized power. They did not want the United States over their shoulder. So they had a communist revolution led by a man named Fidel Castro, and um, uh, Che Guevara was involved, and they uh, they, they won. They, they, Russia supported them, and they uh, did that. Actually, Fidel Castro even asked you know for our help at one point. We were like, no, we're not getting involved in that. We're, we're friends with the old regime. We're not going to get involved with that. Remember that for next week. We'll come back to that. Uh, but Castro uh, is successful in this revolution. He becomes a new leader, and he actually kicks out 25% of the population of Cuba. All the people that supported the old government, all the wealthy people, take all their money, kick them out. Where do they go? They go to Miami, closest city uh, right in Florida. So Miami is a huge Cuban population still. A lot of them do not like Fidel Castro, the Castros in Cuba. So Dwight Eisenhower and the CIA come up with this plan called the Bay of Pigs invasion. They're going to train the exiles, the people that were kicked out. We're going to train them to fight, send them back into Cuba to fight Castro, overthrow him again, and take it back. No one will know we're involved. That's it. So, 
you know, first day on the job, CIA comes to JFK and says, do you want to keep this going or no? What are you going to say? You know, like, let's trust the, the other guy. Let's trust the World War II general. Let's do it. Bay of Pigs invasion happens. Massive failure. Castro finds out about it. His army is ready. Kills them all. Crushes them. Castro comes out publicly. Said this was from the United States. The United States tried to overthrow me. You know, this is, this is a war. Um, this is a war action by the United States. And Cuba's 90 miles. It's the difference from Pittsburgh to Erie. You know, uh, I mean, they can do some damage. So that's, that's, that's some egg on JFK's face right at the beginning. And now Cuba... They're mad. Fidel Castro's mad. So the Russians, Soviet Union, starts to give nuclear weapons to Cuba. And we find this out because we're spying on them because we spied on everyone and they spied on us. Uh, but we actually tracked these nuclear weapons from the Soviet Union, from their nuclear facilities, on a ship to Cuba. That's bad. Uh, it's one thing. We can stop a nuke from the Soviet Union if it's fired halfway across the world. But 90 miles, they could blow up Miami. It'd be gone in a matter of minutes. So, this is called the Cuban Missile Crisis. What do you do? If you're John F. Kennedy, you have kind of three choices. You know, you can um, ignore it. You can, you know, do nothing, tell no one, and hope it just doesn't happen. You know, you can um, tell the American people, be honest with them. And um, if you are, you know, then do we launch a full-scale invasion? Or do we find something kind of in between? So, JFK decides to tell the truth to the American people, which is a good move. Um, and he was honest about it. I, I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to, we are going to try to persuade them without full war. Um, but pe people need to be ready. It was kind of two weeks of tenuous. You didn't know if nukes were going to fall out of the sky on you. And, and you know, that's scary. Um, but he picks that middle of the road choice. And what we do instead of going to war is we blockade the island of Cuba. We take our Navy and form a ring around the island of Cuba. Uh, they're an island. It's hard to get food. You can't grow all your food there. You have to import things. So that's what's going to happen. Um, the other thing that he does is uh, he puts an embargo on them. So we're going to stop trading with Cuba. And to, to stop trading with them uh, is something that has continued through today. Uh, JFK, kind of a funny story. He liked Cuban cigars. They have very fine tobacco, the, the soil there in Cuba. Cuban cigars are very, very good. Um, and JFK loved them. So he ordered a big crate of Cuban cigars. And then immediately put the embargo in place. So he was the last person to get anything from Cuba and kept those Cubans in his desk. Um, so that, um, that, that was another uh, issue. Uh, and so did the rest of NATO and countries that supported us. So we have this blockade around Cuba. A Russian ship is coming to import goods of some sort. Maybe weapons, I don't know. Uh, and this is the standoff. This is on TV. What's going to happen? This Russian ship fires at us. It's World War III. Here we go. Nuclear war. You know, um, and it kind of gets to the blockade, and um, the captain doesn't fire. They turn around. They leave. They go back. The agreement is release the blockade. All the nuclear weapons will go back to the Soviet Union, and that's it. So Cuban Missile Crisis, huge win for JFK. Didn't go to war, but we fixed the problem. Um Cuba's a really interesting place today. It's still technically communist. Uh, Fidel Castro is now dead, um, but still communist. But there hasn't been much trading with them. So if you go to, to Cuba, all their cars are from the 1950s, from before the embargo. You know, it's, it's some crazy stuff. So it's so something you can look up. Um, you know, we have other competitions with the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, JFK promises to put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. We, we hadn't really even been to space yet. Um, it, you know, it was, um, we hadn't really left the atmosphere and, and been close to that yet. Um, so the space race, the Olympics, and Miracle on Ice, you know, a lot of competition with the Soviets what, of what was better, communism or democracy. Um, John F. Kennedy's going to get assassinated 1963, November 22nd. Um, Lee Harvey Oswald shoots him from Texas School Book Depository. If we were still in school, we'd get into the conspiracy theories. I'm not going to get too far into it here. Uh, but suffice to say, there's a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding his assassination. Um, and you can watch it on uh, the Zapruder film. Watch it. Um, so um, the guy that takes over for him is his vice president, Lyndon Johnson. Now, Lyndon Johnson and JFK, domestically, they aligned. Um, Lyndon Johnson's big push is going to be called the Great Society. We're going to end... Poverty and discrimination in America. Lyndon Johnson was a Southern Democrat. He was, um, 
you know, he he was really good. He had been in Congress for so long. He, he was really good at twisting arms and getting things done. Um, something we'll get into next week. Uh, the one thing he disagreed with John F. Kennedy on was Vietnam. And, and we'll talk more about Vietnam next week. Uh, but Vietnam is going to be a topic where JFK was sending advisors, not troops. And there's some theories that he wanted to get out of there. And Lyndon Johnson is going to be the one that escalates Vietnam to a full-scale war. So, um, but part you know part of his great society of things we have today: Medicare, uh, medical insurance for people 65 and older, something very popular. Medicaid, uh, medical insurance to uh, people that can't afford it. So you know the Obamacare is an expansion of Medicaid, something that Lyndon Johnson came up with um, and got passed. So a lot of those things. Um, all right, I, you know I, I think I'm going to end there. Um, Next week, we'll talk about the Civil Rights Movement. We'll talk about the Vietnam War. We'll talk about Richard Nixon. And, um, you know, maybe we'll, get, maybe we'll get a little further past that. But that's kind of my plan. Um, that's it. So if you can go on the Google form, there's one question to ask you about the Cold War. And answer it in like a paragraph and kind of relax. Hopefully things are good. Um, email me if you have problems or questions. And, um, you know, if, if you want more in-depth and stuff, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. See you.